Okay, this talk is about Lua, which is tiny embedded, embeddable scripting that doesn't suck. Um, I'm Kyle Cordes. I, I hate about me slides, but I will tell you what I'm up to nowadays. <clears throat> I'm learning closure. I'm teaching people how to make SaaS businesses work. I'm hiring people to grow my consulting firm, and I'm marketing my consulting firm while I look for my next big thing. So that's what I'm doing today with no, no historical bio. This is, the, this is what you were sold, but <clears throat> when you were sold it, it was unclear if it was going to be a 20 minute talk or a 50 minute talk. So what you're actually going to get is that we're, we're going to leave out all the how and just cover the why, and then uh, not really mention the others except for in, in passing. Um, if you want to know how to program Lua, I mean, l look it up. I, I can't possibly beat that here, but you can find by spending 20 minutes on the web. <clears throat> okay, so why should we care about yet another scripting language? How, how many people are using any kind of scripting language inside their, like as part of another app today? That's pretty good. I'd say about 25%. Name a couple. JavaScript. JavaScript. Ruby. Ruby. Pearl. Pearl. Groovy. Groovy. Anybody else? Python. Python, okay. Okay, so... Why should we care about yet another one? Um, because it doesn't suck. That's why we should care about another one. Um, why does it not suck? There's six reasons I'm going to give you why it doesn't suck. The first is that your Lua code running inside of another application is in a jail. It, it cannot get out. It's very effectively, it's just as trapped as this baby is here. Um, some people call that a sandbox. In the Java world, we call it a sandbox. But the important thing about it is that it's not an added on feature. So, for example, the, sometimes the Java security model is, is glorious in its complexity, but it seems like you have to use it just right to get the right security. Um, I've worked with solutions that use Python as an embeddable scripting language, and the real difficulty there is that Python by default can do anything that, that, that you can do as a user. And so, systems that try to use Python as an embeddable scripting language have to do a lot of work. Have there uh, thousands of changes in the Python source tree to make it safe to embed script Python scripting. With Lua, by default, Lua code can't do anything that affects the outside world. Lua has no I.O. primitives. If you get Lua, with, without you issuing a line of code to enable it, a Lua script inside of another piece of software can't even print. It literally does not even have system out print line built into it. It only has the primitives that are provided to it by the application that it runs inside. And I, I, can, I can do some Q&A at the end for some examples of that. Um, but the, the contrast here to Java security <coughs> is pretty enormous in that that safe default plus only the enabled primitives means that if you don't know a lot about scripting, you're likely to create a safe but not very useful plug-in system. Well, it turns out that in the sort of wild west of people out, out in the world using your software, that's a pretty good default. It's not as good as the default being that it's both safe and incredibly powerful, but you're not going to find a scripting language that is both by default safe and by default very, very powerful, you'll find ones that are one or the other. Uh, there have been some really great uh, war stories where systems that had embeddable scripting, it turns out you could subvert the entire a huge software system, you could insert one script into like a billing module and take over the whole thing. I've, I've heard war stories along those lines. With Lua, you're very unlikely to accidentally give that capability. <coughs> Uh, the next thing that's good about Lua is that it's small. Um, so how small is it? Well, at minimum, it, it, this, if you put just the, just the core in and it's compiled the right way, it'll be less than 100 kilobytes added your, to your application. So you have a, let's say you have a large complex application for, uh, I said billing before, so you have a big billing application, you want to add the ability to script how bills are put together. It's possible you might only add 100 kilobytes to your application to do that. That was a really big deal when Lua came out, say, it's about seven or eight years old. When Lua first appeared, that was a really big deal. Today, I'm not, it's not so much because like, people don't care so much about adding a few megabytes to their application size today. But it actually turns out two matters still in small apps. You can embed a Lua scripting capability 
inside an iPhone app and not even make the iPhone app much bigger, which is, which is pretty nice. Um, by comparison, JavaScript, there's someone in the audience, how big is a V8 or something like that, or how big is a... No, four or 500 kilobytes compiled. Yeah, minimum four or 500 kilobytes. I'm pretty sure that the Java implementation is over a megabyte and a half yeah, yeah. for the jar. So a pretty big difference. If you have an application where scripting is a pervasive feature all over, who cares? But if you're just trying to do that foot in the door of adding a little bit of scriptability, the fact that it only adds 100 kilobytes is really nice. It's a pretty good payoff. <clears throat> uh, the next thing about it is that the language, the Lua language is very simple. Um, there's something like 20 keywords and 20 operators and you can actually write a lot of software using only half the keywords and only a fourth of the operators. Um, it's quite a lot simpler than something like JavaScript. So there's a, a running joke, you know, with a, there's a picture, the JavaScript complete reference and JavaScript the good parts, you know, they're like this big. Um, well, Lua, in a sense, only has its good parts, so it's, it's just a tiny language. Because it's a tiny language, it's, it's been shown to be really easy to get people who aren't software developers to start hacking together just little bits of Lua. Yeah, I mean, you're, no language is going to magically make non-developers create large, complex, beautiful things, but just to get something working at all, it, pretty simple. Uh, <clears throat> next, Lua is extremely flexible, and uh, by that I mean that it's It'll seem familiar to you if you're using modern dynamically typed languages like uh, JavaScript again. It's, it's not that big of a chasm. You're not going to feel like you went back to the dark ages. It's dynamically typed. You use first class functions pretty much everywhere. The only annoying thing is that they didn't realize how nice first class functions are, how pervasively people would want to use them. So you have the word function as the keyword to define one. And there, there are no uh, reader macro equivalents in Lua. And so there's no way to, to make the word function go away. So it's a little bit annoying if, if you use a, a functionally heavy style, you're going to have the word function a lot in your software. But you can kind of get over that. Um, it's extremely easy to make Lua interoperate with other systems. Uh, for example, calling back and forth to C, like even in the world where that's pretty easy, it's even easier in, in Lua than with a lot of uh, <coughs> scripting added. Certainly easier than uh, Python, for example. Um, Lua is written in extremely clean C. I think they even call it super clean C. Uh, they ad adhere even more tightly than they need to to the ANSI specs, and that's made it ridiculously uh, portable. So although it it's not written on like a, on a runtime like Java or something. It's it's actually it's in fact I think it actually ports to a lot more platforms than Java does, which is pretty impressive. Um, and then lastly, <clears throat> although the Lua core is that tiny piece that I talked about a few slides ago, there are actually a, a very large number of libraries already integra integrated with, into Lua off the shelf that make it. Uh, so let's say you want to do XML parsing. Well, Lua doesn't have XML built in, but there's three or four decent choices you can download and integrate in that are well proven. And then you can you could use a Lua wedge between some XML and your application's API, for example. That'd be very straightforward to do. You wouldn't have to write much code. Uh, five, the fifth reason out of six, it's really fast. By the way, does anybody get the reference here? What car this is? What car is this? This is this is DHH's car. So. I wish it was a rail talk, it would kind of make more sense, but <clears throat> I don't know of anybody in the Lua world who has been this successful yet. So, But how fast is it? It's, ri it's really, really fast. To give you an idea, I don't know if I should have zoomed this slide bigger, but for example, here is the, the basic Ruby, interpreted Ruby. Matt's implementation. And on this particular benchmark, this, this is not a single benchmark, this is the aggregation of a whole bunch of benchmarks. But it takes 158 times as long as whatever the 1.0 normal, normalization time was. Um, and then you see things like PHP and Perl all in that general area. Here's Python, here's C Python, here's JRuby, which by the way, any, any Ruby people, JRuby is a really fast way to run your Ruby code. Um, but then you see that this is interpreted Lua, and it's actually faster. So it's, it's at 31 on this index, which is it's a pretty broad index. It's actually faster than most other common scripting language. But that's not the impressive thing. The impressive thing is that 
all the way up here is where Lua JIT is. There's a JIT implementation for Lua, and if I understand right, it's a tracing JIT. So people that are into JITs know exactly what that means. But it's it's really a it's really cutting edge. In fact, I get the impression that some ideas from Lua JIT have actually been adopted by some of the other JIT makers. Um, they've it's so good that it actually competes very favorably with the fastest Java JITs. And uh, there's got to be at least a hundred to one difference in the investment in Hotspot versus LuaJet. In fact, it's probably more like a thousand to one difference in the investment in those. So uh, I guess the simplicity of the language coupled with the brilliance of the guy behind LuaJet is why Lua can be up here. But that's, that's pretty amazing. You have a tiny language where the basic interpreted implementation beats most of the common interpreted scripting languages. And then the, the JITed version beats some compiled languages. I mean, it's only a factor on this analysis. I mean, all benchmarks are crap, but this one is still, you know, they all have some value. This is only a factor of two off of, off of compiled C++, which is pretty good. Um, you'll note that it's, it's above Java 6 with the basic dash server setting. So it turns out that for that reason, it can be used in a lot of case, places where performance matters. And we'll hit a couple of those here. So. Lua has a lot of momentum. Um, how many people have used any Lua before in this room? Ever used it before? One, two, three, four, five, six. So six out of about 40 people in the room have used it. Um, that's actually pretty good. I'm surprised the number is that high, I guess, because the six people here saw it and said they had to come. But uh, there's actually enormous momentum behind it. The number one driver is World of Warcraft. How many World of Warcraft players? Two. Okay, I have actually never played World of Warcraft. It's in a bunch of other games. It's like the I'll get there. I'll get there. The World of Warcraft Lua world is so big that there's this large community. There's a bunch of websites of gamers, game hackers, teaching each other Lua, which is pretty wild. Uh, there are multiple published books about Lua in the context of just this one game. And there's a, at least one external IDE. So it's not, not just what's built in the World of Warcraft. Somebody went and made another IDE that simulates the World of Warcraft environment and provides a, de a, like a tracing debugger mechanism to make it easy to debug your Lua code inside World of Warcraft. Like that, is, that is very impressive. Um, and if you keep... The gaming community is full of... Uh, highly competitive people who would not hesitate to exploit any holes in the, the sandbox to get a, an advantage in the game. And so the fact that it survives this large community proves some of the points I made earlier about it's a very well sandboxed, jailed system. Um, Angry Birds, anybody? I'm sure everybody's heard of that, right? That has a bunch of Lua scripting in it. But there's actually 110 games on Wikipedia's list that are scriptable with Lua scripting. I think that is really remarkable. I mean, there's tens of thousands of game titles that have been published, but that, like, it, it spans PCs, consoles, to handhelds. That is, a, that is a very impressive achievement for a language that most software developers have never even heard of. It's not just games, though. Uh, Photoshop Lightroom, any Lightroom users in here? So Lightroom is something like 50% C code and 50% Lua code. Uh, all the stuff that does it, image manipulation is written in C, and the whole uh, flow of the application, including the GUI, is, is all written in Lua. And uh, there's, a, there's a talk that uh, the architect behind that gives, and basically they think they saved, like something, I think he says 40%, they think they saved off their development life cycle by doing that, which I thought was very impressive. Uh, I've used it in a couple of projects at my company, Oasis Digital. You can see the logo <laughs> on here. Um, th and there are many, many more. If you, if you go look at some of the Lua websites, they'll give you lists of hundreds and hundreds of commercial apps where Lua is being used internally. Now, I already mentioned the iPhone a while back. Um, if I had given this talk two months ago, I'd have to tell you that Apple had banned the use of Lua, basically, in, in iPhone apps because they had that, that terms of service brouhaha. Well, they've now opened that back up. It's completely accessible to write a, an iPhone app in anything as long as that anything is shipped inside the app. So it's once again allowable by Apple to create an entire app on their platform where the, you're using the pre-compiled, say, Lua, Lua Jet, and then you're using some pre-compiled graphics libraries and you don't write any low-level code yourself. You only write high-level code. Um, I'd 
I have I haven't found a downloadable sample app that does that. I'd kind of like to see how it, to see how it compares. Um, I know that part of the culture on the iPhone platform is that the winningest products seem to be those that are the most polished, and the most polished tend to be written in Objective C. But I'm curious if you can reach that kind of that level of polish that users expect with this approach. Um, okay, so is Lua the answer to everything, right? Um, so obviously not. So I'll talk to, to one place where it was not. So I had a previous venture. We looked at a bunch of things and we chose JavaScript. One of the guys who helped me, helped me choose JavaScript is in the room. We chose JavaScript over Lua, even though I was a Lua fan and had used Lua. And the reason we did was we had better Java integration, which is a pretty, pretty obvious win. But moreover, everybody knows JavaScript. I mean, it's very, the installed base of people who at least can do something in JavaScript is, is just enormous. Um, in fact, that really should scare a lot of us that there's these hordes of people from outside <laughs> the software world that have learned just enough JavaScript to be dangerous, and they are, in fact, dangerous, and they're coming, and they're, <laughs> they're turning message. But for, for what we were trying to do, we wanted to have the story to tell that our app is scriptable in JavaScript, and hey, if you call a recruiter and say, send me a JavaScript person, they will. And I was concerned that if our story was it's scriptable in Lua, call a recruiter and ask for a Lua developer. I don't know how many recruiters... Are there any recruiters in the room? Good. Um, I don't think very many recruiters would, would have heard of Lua. Um, and we're just about there, so I tried to end five minutes early, and I made it three minutes early, so I have room for questions. So... Go. When, uh, when you were talking about the first couple slides you had where the uh, Lua uh, binary was, compi was compiling less than 100K, is that the interpreter or is that the Lua chip? That was the interpreter. Okay. The bare minimum, interpreter only, just the core APIs built in, not even they have a, a Lua external, which is sort of like a contrib kind of thing. Leave all that out just in for that's what's under 100. I think it adds a couple of hundred more for Lua. It's not bad. Yeah. Questions? <laughs> I can't see any reason why you fundamentally couldn't, but yeah, uh, Android's a kind of a different beast, and I'm not enough of an expert to tell you how, what the progress is there. But I can't think of a reason why it's fundamentally impossible. Other than that, you generally don't ship native code on Android, and so you'd have to be compiling Lua to something that runs on Dalvik. Because I don't, I don't know if I don't think you can ship native code onto a non-hacked Android device. Somebody here had a question. Why do you think there isn't much linkage between Java and Lua? Um, I think so. The question is why is there not much linkage between Java and Lua? I believe the reason is that Lua has its own runtime that expects to run natively on the underlying platform, and so does Java. Java people, as a rule, including me, I've spent a lot of time as a Java person, are strongly biased against pulling out J a JNI-based solution, which is what Lua would have to be, when there's a non-JNI-based solution that will meet their needs well. So I think that's why. Yeah, I mean, why not, if nothing else, we implement, think of JLua that interprets... I think there is a JLua out there. I have no idea if it, if it does that, but <clears throat> there's no reason you, you couldn't, but I think it's, I think it's a cultural factor. It's, it's performance as well. I mean, it, you know, last year the <coughs> JRuby guy was here was talking about performance. Sure. You know, until the JIT guys, you know, get or I'm sorry, the that was Charles Nutter. Yeah. They had they had to work so hard to get, to get the yeah. It, and now the next turn of the JVM is supposed to have this invoke that again. Right. Code. I mean, they're killing themselves to get that, but like, Lua JIT has way better than that. Right. Uh, you saw my slide, and like, it's already there. You can go download it, use it today. Probably do it. Look at the other way around. Right. Compiled. Well, the, the underlying runtimes are so different that... More questions. We have another one minute. Um, what's the tiniest um, JavaScript runtime you've come across and how, um, how big is it compared to uh, Lua? I'm not a JavaScript, JavaScript expert enough to yeah. say. Okay, which uh, ask, did you use ask around. for your... Uh, for your uh, uh, what's the name of the one that runs on Java? Rhino. Rhino. We used Rhino. Because we, it was, we were running inside of a big enterprise Java app. That was the right answer for us. Anybody else? Okay, that's it. I'm ending on time. Thank you for showing up. <laughs>